So it says uh, 6 p.m. on my clock. So I think we should uh, we should start already to have later on no issues with time. Mm -hmm. so hello, everyone, and um, welcome to this particularly exciting part of our conference. Uh, we have this lecture by Yvonne Adjambo Uwar, entitled Imagination, Thresholds, and Inri, Summons to Alt Decoloniality, which will be directly followed afterwards uh, at 7 p.m. by a conversation with artists on relational transdisciplinarity and artistic academic knowledge production with Ute Fendler, Valerie Buber, and Gilbert Ndi Chang. My name is Joschka Phillips. I'm a junior research group leader here at the Africa Multiple Cluster. And it is a great pleasure and an honor for me to introduce the speaker of tonight, Yvonne Akiambo Uwar. And an honor for us to have you, Yvonne. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you. Before we start, just a few technical announcements. The live transcript is below, as always. And uh, also, we hope to have a few minutes after the lecture for questions. So please do not use the chat function, but use the Q&A function. And of course, you can already type your question during the, during the talk uh, so that we can go right away into the Q&A after the talk. Now, the more I read by uh, Yvonne Adjambo War, the more I listened to her lectures and about her biography, I have to admit the more intimidated I became <laughs> by the task of introducing her. Uh, a writer whose very first story, so the very first story she ever wrote, The Weight of Whispers, won the prestigious Kane Prize for African writing. An author who sprinkles words like paroxysm, desultory, and kerfuffle across her sentences as if they were mundane spices. Uh, and a gifted speaker and a wordsmith whose writing relishes the complexity of human relations, to use the words of Abdul Raza Gurna. Now, Yvonne was so kind and sent around uh, two versions of her biography about her varied meanderings and career paths, uh, in which she also hints at what may await us in a few minutes. She writes about herself that, quote, she is sometimes leered by very important institutions to give a set the cat among the pigeons keynote address on one elevated theme or another. Sometimes immediately after the lecture, she has to be spirited out of the country." Unquote. Now let's assume the Africa multiple cluster um, is one of those very important institutions and that its task of reconfiguring African studies is in need of disruptive and sincere voices of voices that echo the agitations and commotions that our institutions may seek to attenuate and absorb, and, and voices that are intent on speaking the truth while allowing for a concept of truth um, that is more than cognitive. The online setting of this lecture, of course, reduces any risk of you being spirited out of the country, Yvonne, and unfortunately <laughs> reduces your presence among us to a virtual one. <laughs> oh, this only makes the cat in you more comfortable. <laughs> now, before I allude to Yvonne's uh, impressive biography, I would like to shortly relate some of her work to the theme of this conference, Reflecting Modalities. In Yvonne Adyambu Uwar's work, modalities are intertwined and multiple. They blend and fuse constantly and escape categorization. Her writing tends to create a polyrhythmic sensation, fast-paced events of different measures embedded in long durée historical relations. Her second novel, The Dragonfly Sea, for instance, interlaces the historical links between Africa and China with the political paranoia over religious extremism and how they shape the crisis and conations of a patchwork family and especially the coming of age of Ayana, a girl whose most irresistible passions are thunderstorms and being swallowed by the sea on the Kenyan island of Pate. This intertwining of modalities shows reality in its inherent multiplicity. And it also shows that the idea of any single modality is a fiction. And it struck me as a beautiful realization. So there's a fiction at the heart of analysis. For us as a community center, centered around African studies as area studies, an important implication of intertwined modalities is how Yvonne Adyambo Uwar deals with spaces and places. The setting for The Dragonfly Sea, the island of Pate, and the setting for her first novel, Dust, the drylands of Kenya's north, stand for the forgotten and silent snow points of historical relations. Places and spaces in her writings are settings for memories, stories, 
sediments of history and her stories always offer a poignant alternative to the colonial labels and the shallow brands that continue to mark Africa until today. As Ayana's father tells his daughter, who is stupefied by the concept of maps, quote, wares are tricky things. They want to be experienced. They are never ever to be explained, unquote. In fascinating clarity amidst complexity, in words that refuse to be guided by the beaten path, and in a diligent perfectionist mode of a researcher not mincing her words, Yvonne Adyambu Uwo just showcases an ability to connect different historical waves and currents and describe how in an interconnected world, these waves and currents are reflected, refracted, absorbed, or amplified on different scales. In a speech from 2015, Uwo asked, what meaning do you give to this season of extraordinary happenings? And the extraordinariness of happenings since then has all but ceded ground. In tonight's talk, Yvonne Uwo will speak about the role of imagination, of thresholds and ennui, in contexts of calls and movements for decolonization, of disruptions caused and accelerated by the pandemic, and of shifting geopolitical power relations. As shared certainties are crumbling, there's both an opportunity and a need to indulge in new modalities of being and reflecting, of writing and speaking. From the insight of our respective institutions, we may consider such new modalities as intriguing and inspiring while remaining caught in predictable rhythms. Yet the art of missing a beat, of getting carried away, of failing to make sense through cognition is just as valuable for the polyrhythmic enterprise. Yvonne Adyambu Uwo was born in Nairobi and has since moved across various professional and geographic spaces. She studied English, history, TV and video development and creative writing at the Kenyatta University, the University of Reading, UK and at the University of Queensland, Brisbane, Australia. She was the director of the International Film Festival in Zanzibar from 2003 to 2005, after a previously mentioned short story, The Weight of Whispers, had been published in 2003 by the Kenya-based literary magazine Kwani, co-founded by Binyavanga Wainaina. Her award-winning debut novel, Dust, followed in 2014 and has been translated into various languages, just like her second and equally acclaimed novel, The Dragonfly Sea. Currently, she's a DAED artist in residence in Berlin, working on a new novel with the working title, The Coffee Mistress. In addition to her profession as a wordsmith, Yvonne worked as a computer technologist, event producer, business development advisor, and as an environmental and conservation activist. A self-designated world pilgrim, she and her stories circumnavigate the globe while seeking to enhance and promote vantage points of, from, and inspired by Africa. Africa in its relation, relationality, multiplicity, and its sense of being comfortable with its complexity. It's a great pleasure to have you here, Yvonne, uh, if only virtually. Uh, the floor is yours, the pigeons are aligned, and we are very much looking forward to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much for such a generous and insightful um, introduction. I, I look forward, to, I hope to live up to um, its, uh, its particular scope. Um, hello there, everybody. Uh, in this odd days of, of shifting world spirits, I guess it's only human to ask, are you all well? Are you well wherever you are? Before I begin, I want to also, uh, if you allow me, acknowledge the tragedy of the floods here in Germany. And I want to also express my sympathy to those affected applying lessons from the pandemic, which uh, for me means to, to learn to be gently aware of and to always seek to be tender about human woundedness and suffering, not to ignore it. And we are as beautifully ephemeral as fireflies, aren't we? Back to the paper. I had sent the abstract to uh, Clarissa, Professor Clarissa Viaka, having scratched it out on a piece of paper and then copied it out to my phone, climbing one of the montane forest hills I was on, waiting for a signal, and then I hit the send button. 
returning from that journey weeks later, I finally looked up what I had submitted to, uh, to Clarissa. The mountain forests I was in are in a, pl a place called Loiter Hills, where pure oxygen flows. I reread what I had sent and concluded that I had been high. No pun is intended. High and lightheaded. What the fiddlesticks. I spent the next weeks clutching my head, for when I read the abstract, I wept. In the morning of my post-mountain descent, re descent regret, I wrote to Clarissa to tell her that I had repented and recanted. That plea sent from one of the airport lounges between Nairobi and Berlin got lo lost. It meant that I was too late to offload myself. One must be honorable, at least that's what my mother taught me. Coincidentally, soon after I was sent off to Leukerbad in Switzerland, high mountains again, fresh, heady air. In the dizziness, the Leuter mountain muses returned, except they were using a dialect of Swiss German I had never heard before. But that's okay, in the bliss of free translation, uh, this is what emerges. Um, so in the simplest of words, um, this causerie, uh, becomes one of the many inquiries into a post-pandemic world reality. Now, so much so, I mean, a lot of things have changed, you're aware of that, you know, but, but a lot of things have fallen into disarray, like that nine to five thing we assumed was going to be the standard. Uh, and, and as you have noticed, so many former employees have discovered that they are human beings whose greatest and most precious asset is time for example, and that in a wide world, they can actually work from home or from the beach in Diani, South Coast, Kenya. And, and, and maybe this becomes a space where we can return uh, to keystone questions, uh, the answers and replies of which evolve after every experience. Uh, so, I, yeah, I guess it's my excuse as well to ask again what I tend to always ask, what does it mean for us to be human, especially after the pandemic? What does the humanity of the other mean for us now? after the common story of the global pandemic. Therefore, the gist of this presentation is offered very roughly in three parts. Part one is a case for thresholds. Part two, imagining futures, which elides into part three-ish, alt decolonialization. The epistemological underpinnings, the references are oblique though, uh, but these are drawn from Mignolo, Buzel, Hinkelamet, Kiano, Saar, and Diane. Uh, and, and actually, uh, in terms of decoloniality, I'm with Mignolo on this one. Uh, I prefer the word uh, to frame my own interrogations. Paraphrasing, dear Walter Mignolo, decolon decoloniality denoting ways of thinking, knowing, being, and doing that precede and were impacted by the European invasions and colonial project. It is indicative of the ongoing nature of struggles, constructions, and creations that continue to work within colonial, coloniality's margins and fissures to affirm that which coloniality has sought to negate. It's an attitude and practice, not a static condition. The paper's flourishes are directed at the state of the scholarly quests and structures of the African studies nodes and modes and hubs and their crisis of meaning in this new world, world, world to which we allude. The paper is infused, informed by, permeated by insights delivered by the crucible that is the ongoing COVID-19 crisis. What a threshold experience for humanity. We were all in one story together, although now some people, some people are trying to repackage themselves as the heroes. Still, the pandemic helped reduce all our grand posturings, our every propaganda into the primordial basics life or death and how humanity uses the tools of its experiencing and experimentation to support or sustain either life or death i know there are more exceptions to the general rules and worst case examples to which i will refer not sweeping statements but hyperbole in order to elucidate a matter of aesthesis aesthesis the aesthetic muse aesthetic muse for this causery is on we stories you understand need to have turning points that lead to transformation not stasis so 
just how much longer are we going to have the same, same kind of diagnostic conversations, abstracting the very visceral and tangible human, human experiencing and situations to generate ever new concepts that serve little other purpose than generating more concepts? Are you not bored already? At the core is a consciousness of a generational as well as a global shift mediated by all forms of unraveling of assumptions. The argument and conviction is an ancient one. Old wineskins cannot contain new wine. That we are in some sort of liminal season of humanity cannot be denied. What is arguably most needed now is a rediscovery of and a capacity to coexist with, with the unknown, with uncertainty, to dismantle that which no longer serves ideals, to embrace uncertainty, and to return to a deeper exploration of possibilities in the realm of the imagination. One of the questions undergirding this um, um, exploration is this, what exactly are, what, where exactly are the main receptacles for the gathering of and engagement with a quintessential, in this case, African story, in, uh, you know, quintessential African storying, imagining and knowing. Are these, are these the African study centers? Uh, you know, the correct answer is unfortunately, yes. But then whose interests, aspirations, and future do these centers and hubs serve primarily? Which underlying mythos of being do they serve and do they respond to? And in the structure of that mythos, what role do those from the imagined periphery serve, even when they're invited to undertake a post, uh, a post diploma? Protagonist, hero, I really hope you don't believe that. By the way, this is not a judgment call. The fact that the primary repositories of African related derived knowledge, imagining and exploration are in these sites are not the fault of these sites. The responsibility is African. We own the dearth of imagination, the inability to prioritize the urgent need to harness the superpower of thought, vision, and imagination as a strategy to explore and maybe gain power, control, wealth, and intelligence linked to creating futures. As the ontological origins of the centers are most dubious, are mostly dubious, derived from the most bizarre imaginings of an Africa that existed only in the lurid imagination of the stranger and built on contested and muted histories, it should be no shock that the primary characteristics of these spaces is at least overtly. We are not ignorant of the intelligence and information gathering covert purposes of these spaces. Not this one, of course. Well, the former has led to a ceaseless circling of metaphorical and historical wounds, and for the most part, do well as concept generation sites, which do not turn ideas into not just practice, but tangible product. Uh, are you not bored yet? Another question underpinning all these soul-searching eruptions, all these decolonizing going-ons are, are is are we to assume that we are all singing from a common universal and cosmological script, that the substance and structure of things are not a forceful cultural iteration, and that all it needs to get it right is to be tweaked here and there? Do you actually believe that? I'm not being doubtful. I'm just asking this question as an in intrinsically pluricentric and pluriversalist African. I negotiate, traverse, and occupy, sometimes at different times, sometimes simultaneously, worlds within worlds, worlds within worlds. I'm a card carrying cheering squad member for multipolarity and a fan of the Mignolo led pluriversality as a universal project initiative. Anyway, I'm asking as a visiting stranger seeing unexpected cultural habits might. Is one to assume that intrinsic cultural pathologies, faults, insecurities, and biases automatically evaporate from that which a culture frames as its method in pursuing knowledge, even if it calls that method scientific and objective? Ah, ennui. Thresholds, as you also know, are great habit-breaking opportunities. Ennui. I looked it up. A feeling of listlessness and dissatisfaction arising from a lack of occupation or excitement. For example, when the European vaccine regimen announced that they were closing entry to those who were vaccinated by products they had not approved of, thereby finding legitimacy to closing entry and access points to majority world's people, that's us, those monitoring social media responses were struck by the sound of 
crickets, indifference, even from the formidable army that is that are the Kenyans on Twitter. The noisiest ones about uh, were, of course, the home guards in the African Union and a few, perhaps four or five African leaders. The other response was the approval given to the Chinese vaccines, almost to underline a point, which I think the EU may have missed, and to prepare to set up local vaccine production hubs with priority given to, you got it, Sinovac and Sinopharm. Apathy, the inability to rouse oneself to give a damn, a quotation taken from the notes of Svetson, the philosophy of boredom. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun finding that book. From the majority world end of things, uh, the boredom has, uh, from the majority world end of things has seeped into the Africa European dynamic. And by the way, this aesthetic orientation by majority world peoples, that's us, is a good sign. It means there's a generation that has stopped listening to missives from the Occident as if they were the Oracle of Delphi, through whose pronouncements their fates were determined. A benefit of Mr. Trump and the very public discombobulation that was the Euro-American COVID-19 responses, which served to break the spell. It's, it's a, all a bit like a Wizard of Oz, isn't it? Or Humpty Dumpty having a great fall. I know all the king's horses and all the king's men and their media machinery are trying to put Humpty together, Humpty Dumpty together again, mostly by touting vaccine nationalism at this stage, but we know, and that you know, that we know. Sneaking out of Afghanistan in the middle of the night after 20 years does not assert the master of the universe thing at all. Anyway, a story apropos of nothing. Actually, I lie. It's a convenient one and serves many purposes. Ready? Once upon a time, on a bright and cheerful morning, with dew on the ground, the scent of new grass in the air, and vast horizons shimmering orange and indigo, the great chief among all beings, the lion, stood on a rock overlooking the rolling plains and distant hills not dissimilar to the one the monkey used to lift the lion cub, Simba, in the film Lion King. The lion surveyed the realm and all territories above and below that were under his domination and jurisdiction. Satisfaction made his chest swell. Descending, he stopped at a nearby ecologically certified rain puddle for a fairly traded sip of water. Mid stoop, lion, saw himself in the mirror of the water. He saw his golden face, his thick black mane, his fierce eyes, and the long history of his exploits and uncontested hegemony. Third, he realized he needed to radiate the glory upon the creatures of the realm and have it reflected back to him. Such a reflection made him shine even brighter. He framed the question and decided on the methodology of a fact confirmation tour of his constituency. In an enclosure next to the acacia, he happened upon the colobus monkey sucking the place of his hand where a thumb was absent. Roar, declared the lion, baying into the monkey's face. Who is the master of the plains, emperor of all that he surveyed, commander of the forest and admiral of its waters, king of creatures above, below, and under the ground? Who alone decrees who should live and who must die? The colobus kowtowed, stretched prostrate on the ground and stuttered, it is thou, O great lion, only thou. The lion approved of the response. Carry on, carry on. Rise once you see my back, he ambled on. Turning west, lion happened upon an eland having early morning breakfast. Eland froze with the leaves in his mouth at the grand and terrible thing he saw before him. Without hesitation, contemplating the possibility of regime change, lion pounced and held eland down by his neck. Breathing his mouthwash breath over the eland, he growled the question, the only question. Roar! Who is master of the plains, emperor of all that is surveyed, commander of the forest and admiral of its waters, king of creatures above, below and under the ground, who alone decrees, who should live and who must die? The eland spat out the answer with a song of grass in his mouth. It is thou, great and merciful lion, only thou. Lion felt even better and therefore extended his charity to a hapless beast. He patted the eland on his head and announced magnanimously, oh well, as you were, eat, eat, be happy, live long. 
With a wave, he left, circumnavigating the landscape, encountering, among others, the marabou stalk, the warthog, and the pangolin, and who all del delivered variations of, it is thou, or fine beast, who are king of the plains, conqueror of the savannah, etc., etc. Near lunchtime, Lion, feeling peckish, thought about taking out a zebra for his snack, after zebra had delivered the answer to the question, the only question. But ho, oh, what was this? 50 meters away, great aunt elephant was browsing, delicately picking up seeds from a baobab pod and ignoring him. Roar, Lion announced himself after gliding over majestically. No response, no reaction. Roar, I demand that you tell me who is master of the plains, emperor of all that is surveyed, commander of the forest and admiral of its waters, king of creatures above, below and under the ground, who alone decrees who should live and who must die? Elephant did not bother to raise her head. A little confused about that and concluding that elephant must be deaf, Lion raised his volume and the sound was as thunder in the hearts of all beings who shivered where they hid and waited to die. Roar, roar, who is master of the plains, emperor of all that is surveyed, commander of the forest and admirals of the waters, king of? Elephant sighed heavily and even the trees trembled. This situation had not been in her plans when she set out for the day. She did not need such negativity in her headspace. She turned to stare at the lion whose fangs were now bared. Elephant took hold of lion with, with, with the tusks. She tossed lion up in the air. Lion came crushing down and dislocated his hips. Elephant proceeded to deliver a thorough beating to the lion who lost four teeth, fractured his paw and turned an unfortunate blue. Elephant then resumed her delicate snacking. After a while, there was a firm drag on her tail. As Kufni, lion lisped through gasps in gaps in his mouth as he gathered pieces of himself, his look was hurt. As Kufni, he repeated. Elephant looked over her shoulder. Lion continued aggrieved. I'm disgusted, disgusted. Why such tangential violence? If you do not know the answer, you should ask. I would have told you. You should have asked me. Who is master of the plains, emperor of all that is surveyed? Elephant trumpeted once. Lion hastened away, hobbled, grumbling, flinching in play, in pain, speaking to himself. If you don't know the answer to something, ask. Ask those who know. Just ask. What's so hard about asking? This is as much about an orientation to a common vision of reality and sense of humanity as it is an inquiry into how to transcend thought inertia, but also to recognize the moments when things have changed. Look, I don't know how anyone can win an old game by playing with a predefined grammar, with predefined structures and argument sequences. You know? If the hegemonic regime is changing, what is our stake? What's the character of our collective imagination? Where are the chances for bringing this into a space where um, these things can unfold in a new way and constrained by prefabricated thoughts, prefabricated elsewhere? If someone, by the way, just, just jumping, if someone shows you repeatedly what they think you are, believe them, by the way, believe them. I was just asking, just kind of doing a random check, how many dedicated European study centers are hosted by Africa and African academic institutions? I couldn't find one. And if they exist, which ones are dealing with futuristic themes and epistemologies rather than say governance and democracy, security, agriculture, uh, you know, or borders and boundaries, especially immigration? And, and very few are talking about, you know, uh, you know, Libya or Syria or, Af or Afghanistan and the implications for the African space. Mm. The newest main themes right now, of course, are Indian Ocean, but that's because of uh, that's with the focus on China, Africa, and Africa China. But these, but uh, and these are marginal studies linked to one might call Africa apologetics that seem to be primarily con primarily concerned with proving. Maybe proving is too bold a word. The correct one is interpreting how human Africans really are or can be. Anyway, majority world people, that's us, inhabiting African studies departments, most of which, not yours, were renamed and, re from, and restructured from old anthropology, ethnography, study of the colonized subject research centers, where said objects corrupted have their humanity negated. So what do you get? 
what is the knowledge and truth you desire, you want, you need? In these spaces, do you obtain an aesthetic joy? You know, um, might some of your interests, uh, do any of these centers perhaps offer things like, you know, yacht design or uh, an axial point of science like technology, futurism, the internet of things, artificial intelligence, geoscience, astrophysics, underwater geology, deep mind, um, you know, uh, Cezanne, mythologizing wilderness, ballet in Legos. And if any of you had a reaction, how are these African studies see your life? Ask yourself why. Isn't the problem then the framing of what African studies means? And who frames it? Who has the agency for the framing of that? And and quite and and does the you know, the African conceptualizing does not start with, nor does it end with European as colonizer. And I, I, really, I, I think this is now where the aspect of when we comes in. Let's stop that. Can we stop it? Is it possible? Um, the consequential, rather embar embarrassing projections that offer themselves as fact really do not further knowledge. For example, false reading the Africa-China relationship as a mirror of Africa and Europe rubs out the continent and its agency. It's long pre-European engagements with the rest of the majority world, you know, uh, by way of our seas. And, and actually, quite frankly, a pro-China stance that is also a pushback for European perfidy in matters like Libya. And what I treat to rub salt into the wounds is the May 13, 2000 sneering cover of The Economist, Hopeless Continent Declaration, which was also the, that's, that was the same year of the first um, China-Africa uh, Congress conference that has created this kind of crisis around China. Um, but isn't this part of a larger epistemological fault with its undercurrent in infantilizing and negating African and also, I guess, majority world agency, fragmenting the continent's geographies and dislocating the diverse peoples from them for from their assorted networks, global networks, insisting that particularly in Africa, any any Africa connected person found in other places like India, Turkey, Iraq, Kazakhstan could only have gone there as slaves even though the people themselves suggested different stories about their own origins. When Pate Islanders long ago spoke of their own Chinese lineages, they also have Portuguese and Indian lineages. They were told they were speaking nonsense. Even as the tombs were being desecrated and stripped of their ceramics by the same genealogy deniers. I get it. Given the way the economic system has been structured and the guarantee of compromise and malleable so-called leaders in Africa, and a commitment of and thinking ga gangs to sustaining the most stupid of national boundaries that were never imagined for us. What can we really do? I think plenty. You know, I, I think the other question I'm asking, what's the point? Uh, I, I, and it's not my question, it's, I guess it's for you. What, what's the point of all this? What's the point? Um, in the interstices of, the, of this long encounter, where are the tangible, mutually beneficial, scaled up life enhancing outcomes, productions, resolutions? How has the subject of the grammar of engagement evolved from the 400 year old fantastical eruptions? In the words of business, for whom in reality have these centers been established? And are they still necessary? How do they serve the imagination and the future? Then there's new stuff happening all the time right now. And, and the elements of these are very much in, ev in evidence. Is there a place for mm, a new kind of imagining um, that, that, that writes the future in, in, the, in, this, in these spaces? Is it even possible with the way, uh, given the uh, ontolog ontological origins of, of, of such spaces? How do you propose, what do, what do you propose to do when the underlying issues that constrain the flow of ideas and the equity of humanity are not yet engaged? Put another way, in this reimagining and reordering of existence, to what do we dedicate the precious power and content of our imagination? Listen, we are at another great threshold in the history of human existence. And we find ourselves in an, amb in an ambiguous state of being with the awareness of a big storm brewing. The dominant hegemon, and yes, I am aware that I'm speaking from within that matrix, revealed the state of its own unraveling. What is 
the response? What is the possibility? I was a very amused but mildly interested reader of notes from the recent G whatever summit. The anti-China shrillness was a bit much, a bit unsettling and not reassuring, not assuring, not reassuring. But it also points out to what the two, to I guess the, the opportunities within liminal spaces. The, the, the uncertainty and this discomfort with fluidity, the dissolution of the hierarchies, of the, of the blurring of boundaries. What opportunities are there? What, what are the opportunities? What are the ways of thinking are there uh, if present themselves? The old ways are not going to work. They're not. But that means then, then it, 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 it now against the crumbling of the reformation enlightenment and enlightenment matrix. What future speaks back to us and from where? And how do we find them? Look, the only risk is a return to the earth burning vampire nature, destructive whatnot, yeah, um, uh, structuring of the world. What, having learned from that, who will write the new story? Who will write the new, um, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 new, the new structuring? It is appropriate that this overlong season is also marking its exit by a slithering out of Kabul in, in the middle of the night after a war that should never have happened and has achieved absolutely nothing, only the egregious slaughter of especially young men. Much profit indeed has been made. Weapons have been tested on humans for effectiveness and deaths quietly miscounted. In the name of cause of democracy, human rights and the rule of law. I guess what I'm trying to say is the language no longer serves. But that means then there's a lot of work and a lot of, a lot of there's, a, there's a kind of a, a, a chasm of possibility um, from which uh, a new lexica of, of being it can be born. It means new pathways within and elsewhere can form. A river always finds its course. I'm suggesting that there are three pivots. Pivot one is a turning within, a movement towards interiority. Lessons from the uh, pandemic. In Kenya, by the way, the local tourism sector that survived during the long, long COVID season did so because they had marketed, the, marketed themselves to the locals and to the region. Of course, the fossils and the tourism board snapped awake to the obvious. They need to prioritize domestic and intra-African tourism. I know it feels it, sh it should be, have been a very obvious thing, but no, I, it, it took the pandemic for people to realize that. The second pivot I'm proposing, and I, I guess, is, 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 an, is a pivot that serves the interest of the majority world, that is us. Without Occidental mediation, which is difficult because that, that has been a very popular habit, mediation via institutions and businesses. The third pivoting is a willful one to broaden one's option. China, coupled with the pleasure that one has, the same one the hyenas of Lion King did every time they tested the word Mufasa, is repeating China to Occidental friends. I know it's mean, it's puerile and petty, but it's still a thrill. And that's an aesthetic experience. Anyway, but this threshold Caesar that we find ourselves is, become, is a rich site of opportunity for all especially the peoples of our world. The portals open into so many other cities of you know, Africa, Asia, South America, and most certainly significantly and interesting, interestingly right into Beijing. Here's my proposal. Let the high priests of Bao dismantle their own altars, condemned with their bovine materialistic gods. Let's use the threshold season to make pilgrimages to site where another imagination of reality can, is proposing itself. We each bear in our spirit the memories and metaphors of another way of seeing and being and sensing, a consciousness of being sheltered in the innermost images of over 10,000 languages. It is time. Don't you desire a firm stake in the maps of the future, shimmering into existence? What new scopes of mutuality based on articulated interest? What would such a grammar of, of that kind of encounter produce? Imagine that. It is a changing world. It's a changed world.
and a very a challenging adjustment period emerges as power centers realign, move and reform the way the world looks. The struggle to consolidate old abandoned positions is also likely to accelerate given the heavy burden of societal and earth challenges. The soul exhaustion most of humanity is enduring mirrors the groaning of nature. We need to be part of a revitalization. Not in the way of the past. By the way, this is also a moment for a very public confession. Decolonial, I don't care for it one way or another. And let me tell you why. As long as the colonial bit is in the morphine, the Occident, the West centers itself as an agent. It does not mind being an agent of or for evil, just as long as it has agency. On we, my dears, that sign aesthetic wants to try another combination, anything, just not this one that has been a thing for, I don't know, 400 years. I am pro-indifference and pro-self-indulgent, African-centering and privileging, and also South American and Asian and Oceanic and Caribbean and Pacific Islands. I'm not excluding the rest, also known as the West as such, that takes too much energy, but just to conjure something fresh, new, interesting, and exciting to enter into that brings everybody in. The elephant has entered the WhatsApp group, and the elephant might have a far more interesting take on the ordering of the earth than what has brought us to the point in which we find ourselves. Finally, and maybe this is the crux of this text, but I won't go too far into the point. It's one of those conversations that in the parlance of Kenyan wedding committees, let me code switch. That is another of our superpowers, by the way. Watu wa ocha, tupatane nyuma yahema. History offers a hidden source of power. The violent and tragic encounter with Europe, and in most places of the north of Africa with Arabia, fostered a change of consciousness and reorientation of the certainties of what it meant to be human and what it meant to belong. The centuries have been relentless on our continent, and a break and pause to simply reflect has been missing. Six seething centuries and constantly fending off, often losing to wily invaders, Craving your bounty is exhausting, isn't it? It takes its toll. I was thinking of the giant Tascas, the bull elephants, who before the European hunters showed up would parade African landscapes with massive tasks. Nature collaborated with the Pachyderm Collective and the next generation bulls have been born with smaller and smaller tasks. Don't you ever wonder what the African collective psyche evolved to survive its human predators? What new archetypes have entered the terrain of our own unconscious? What new visions and gifts do these carry for us? And how do we get to know? The awesome fact of the African endurance is a feat of nature, of time, and of a people. And no, I'm not going to use that word I dislike intensely in the way it is applied to us. Resilience, that word I want, the word I want is not, has not yet been created. But it refers to a strength that I cannot yet name. Look, in another way, what would it take to simply inhabit a space, step into this and get on with a relanguaging, redreaming, reframing, working on a new lexis of and for all of us, rediscovering, delighting in and cooperating with one another um, in projects with the deliberate intent of inscribing ourselves into the future as imagined by, expressed through, painted and written through a thorough, truthful, engaged and shared being, a rediscovery of the sense of one another and of the world and a willful habitation of trans the transcendentals, good, truth, beauty and life. African here, there, wherever, what do we desire for ourselves, for the universe? What is the story of us groaning to be born that will define our deepest and most profound dreams, our own intents to power, wealth, security, and not dominance? That is such a bore, such a desperate handing over to self or to greed and fear, yuck, but to neutrality. We are custodians of the biggest and wealthiest continent. The world depends on African wealth to create their wealth, the same wealth that is used to hold the continent in contempt. But truth is, then the, the world is not that important for our own dreams, nor should we waste the gift of our imagination explaining ourselves to others in energy sapping sessions that lead only into labyrinths. So what I'm asking is, what do we want as a collective? What is our story? What is the story that does not center the tragic episode called, colonial, called colonial, colonization and even its discontents? 
Nobody in the universe will ever create for us a center of study that will ever satisfy our yearnings, nor will they imagine us as coherent, shining, and luminous. That responsibility, that responsibility and that very, very difficult task is ours. And it's a more difficult task than the task of political independence. What do we do with our inner worlds? These are the realms of generation and expansion that are the holes that lead to a holy grail. I'm convinced of this. Caught up in the fully dull and drained of life framing that institutions use to explore and, and structure and distribute knowledge that only that, all, that serves to domesticate the fecund ima human imagination of wonder and creativity. What, what else can be, what other methods can be imagined? What can we call forth and share, first for ourselves and then with the others? Listen, the relentless bombardment of negativity and a gram of diminution, even if it is scientifically proven and studied, all it has done is press down body, our bodies and press down our dreams. The obsession with only themes and studies that prove our pathologies, even sophisticated malice and nastiness takes a toll. It takes its toll. There is power in words. Yeah, you don't need me to tell you that. Look, I, I'm, I'm just jumping some of the things I said only in, in, in the interest of kindness. I use the word necromancy and malefic repetitions, uh, but I, I'll, I'll leave that for, for another time. The pandemic offered a reprieve from the ceaselessness of gross foreign incantations. For a time in an equal world, struggling the same way, with the same story, struggling with a common experience, there was a revelation. Our duty and work and knowledge immensities, our timelessness as inheritors and custodians of something good, something true, something beautiful. We're experienced in a refreshing way. There are more exuberant stories that are trapped in so many inner, inner, inner lives. What treasures these hold for our most intimate yearnings? And how do we share them? Who do we share them with? And where do we do? Where do we share them? And in what languages that speak is particularly to aspirations of whole, wholeness? And, and would those languages end up in your African studies program? Let me end here so that we have time before maybe brief um, um, explorations. But after this encounter, what do our chat? people from the house, let's meet, let's have tea behind the tent. The, the, the Shemeji, our in-laws and entanglements, Asia, Oceania, the Caribbean, South America, wait a bit, we'll call you in an hour. There's a thing we need to discuss, you know, that thing. As for the rest, don't mind us. The music is good, the food plentiful, the cake is served, eat, dance, leave at your leisure. Remember that lights out, uh, the light will be switched off in an hour. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne, for, uh, um, yeah, I think I didn't uh, um, say anything wrong when I was talking about the cat. The cat became a lion, actually, but uh, yeah, uh, for, thank you for your strength, your insight, uh, the immediacy of your words. Um, this has been, um, yeah, an, an amazing lecture. Thank you so much. Welcome. Um, now, um, I'm looking for uh, questions. Um, there is um, one question uh, that says, I'd love to hear about your personal relationship struggles with language, whether the concept of native languages, as in parentheses, is of any relevance to you, even pinpoints from your own personal history with language use. Um, I don't have a struggle with language. I like language. I like words. I've always liked words. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I know there's supposed to be certain positions one takes. I, I love, I love words. I love languages. Um, and I am, I'm fascinated by, uh, by the shape of, of, of letters. So I, I find some, I find this, I find languages, wherever they are, a, 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 real, a real pleasure to encounter. Um, so, you know, I don't know, I don't know if that, I, I'm not sure it answers the questions, but really, no, I'm maybe not that, the person to ask. Um, uh, yeah, 
I can't I can't do that googie thing or whatever. I I love I love languages and I don't care where they come from. Perhaps as a um, as a follow up, since uh, right now there are no other questions. Um, um, I was wondering about your relation to research. Um, I, I mean, you are in, in, in many ways a researcher, but you go about exploring truths in very different ways. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether there's any sort of concept that would encapsulate your approach to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I could lie. I could lie and say yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, um, if there's a question, and it's, uh, if there's a question I have about something, I will go either to a library or go ask somebody, or go to the place itself. Um, it's mostly, I guess, embodied, um, and, and I think that's a generic. Uh, when I'm working on a new story, um, I, you know, I call I call the muse. A, uh, I've got I've got a high maintenance muse. Other writers have muses that will allow them to write the story from wherever. I've got a muse that wants me to go to the place and experience it and, and will not, I, I cannot write until something has been embodied, you know, until I feel it from within. So there's that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there are comments. Um, uh, El Nathan says, thanks for this, Yvonne. As always, your clarity is refreshing. Uh, hello, El Nathan. <laughs> There's uh, Christine Fogg William um, who says, Thank you for your talk. I'm intrigued uh, by your observation that there is power in words. Um, and then uh, Christine says, I hope I heard you right. You said that you did not care for the decolonial. Could you please elaborate on this? Okay. <laughs> Um, the way it, the, the way the discussions are framed right now, Christine, it's simply that I'm part of the ennui I was, to which I referred was that as long as we speak colonial or decolonial, the the centering, um, the inevitable centering of the of the where of I guess the the colonial the former colonial states. Um, for lack of a better word, I hesitate, the West. It doesn't cover the, it's, it's, it, you know, it's an untruthful word for saying the West. But yes, that, I, I, I want to be selfish. I desire kind of, a, a, you know, a greater kind of selfishness that, mm, that you know, where I, I call it the majority world, have a starring role. And the colonial experience is treated as, yes, brutal, vicious, nasty, and all those nasty things that it has not come, to, it has not reckoned with. Um, but it, I, you know, it's been over what? I, certainly in my own country, over 60 years of talking about the same thing in the same way. There's a way in which, uh, what that which we preoccupy ourselves with um, wastes energy that could be released for other spaces, I think. I'm curious, I'm really interested in what, what would a conversation between um, uh, um, the formerly imagined, you know, peripheral worlds look like? Um, South America and, uh, and Africa in conversation, the Caribbean and Asia in, in deep and profound conversations, and, you know, uh, the kind of conversations that emerge with um, ideas and projects and the grammar and, and concepts. What would, what would all of that look like, even if it's just for a while, just relief from this? centering of, of, of you know you know that whole thing of I don't care what you say as long as you're talking about me I'm done I'm kind of there's a part of me that's kind of done with that uh, Jenny has another question um, what about you and the Palestinian in conversation Hello, what, the, what about? What about you and the Palestinian in conversation? Yes. Oh, that would be that would be blissful. When? When can we do it? Okay. I will we'll be waiting for answers in that regard. Uh, <laughs> soon. Um, Christine sort of thanks you for, for these comments. Intriguing. Um, 
perhaps sort of um, also to 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 sort of allude to to what you've just said, sort of the the decentering of this whole, you know, you know, the the centering of the West, even you know, however it is being addressed. What do you see in terms of sort of um, you know new beginnings that they're of that decentering? It's not something that is completely absent, um, but you know, what do you see around you that you know uh, ah. with inspiration in that regard? You know, uh, what happened was um, there was a, 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 the the poets and uh, and 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 thinker um, Alvin Pang put together a conversation uh, called, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, confluences, around that, that, that focused on the ocean, the Indian Ocean, or well, the Swahili Sea, the oceans or the Western Ocean, the, the seas that we share. And most, what I was completely struck by was how, and uh, we, had, uh, um, we had participants from, I guess, non, mm, the non-West, um, but what, what struck, and it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't by intent necessarily, but what was amazing was the kind of energy, the kind of, uh, um, uh, the kind of, uh, if you want, the grammatical construction, the stories that emerge, um, even around inquiry and interrogation that were exciting and refreshing um, in, in unexpected ways that I kept thinking, but why, why haven't we done this? Why haven't we done this before? In, in this kind, in a kind of, you know, concentrated and in very intentional kind of way. And it's not about excluding anybody. That would be repeating the kind of the sins of the past. But it's more about uh, covering up for lost, you know, all the, all the lost, you know, fill, filling the gaps um, and, and, and allowing the things that have been suppressed to, to be born. Because I think they have, it's important for the world. It's important for the world that is uh, stumbling about right now. Uh, the, the old grammar does not no longer fit us. It really does not fit us, and it's it's discouraging every time you, when you pick up the you know the the, the newspapers and find that the, you know, even with the strangeness of these times, um, there is an attempt to squeeze people, squeeze the world back, into this very in this grammar that's so so debilitating and and small and ridiculous. I was I was struck when when reading your your book the the dragonfly sea um, about um, you sort of deciphering a, a very different grammar um, and sort of I think I think sort of when when listening to you um, and reading your words it's it's like you have two different languages uh, of course you also have different audiences <laughs> um, um, but I see sort of in, in, in your writing um, quite a lot of that grammar. Is that something that you observe as such, or is that also something that uh, you develop and experiment with as in, from an author's voice? I don't know, I don't know. I, I, maybe that, 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 that becomes the, the, you know, the literary critics are the ones who maybe identify these things. I, I, when I write a story, I'm just writing the story in the way that it shows up. Mm -hmm. in the in in the word in in the language it, it shows up with um, but also having said that um it points to what i what i'm now calling this one of the superpowers it's not just that we're code switches um, but we're people who live in multiple worlds at the same time so and 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 and, and these are strengths that we have never we don't really play up the uh, you know as a kenyan and i think that happens this is a feature of most people for most people you know from our kind of world is that you live with many languages at the same time uh, and you live with many cultures you, you we are plural mm -hmm. so it's easy to now it's not easy not necessarily easy uh, we move between worlds both within and without yeah and then maybe that shows up in the text yeah. there's uh, one more question so uh, El Nathan uh, had had promised that he would ask a question it's a little bit late but you have uh, we have to sort of switch very soon to the next <laughs> but I, want you, I would like to, to perhaps to shortly respond to this. Uh, mm -hmm. He asks, do you find that academia is a site for the production of this grammar that debilitates and reduces us? Or is it manufactured, uh, manufactured elsewhere? It's academia. It's in academia. It's entirely in academia. <laughs> um, it, 
Become a crazy lady, it's become like that. You, you, you know, the like which is you know, okay, okay. I, I shouldn't generalize because apart from university, my <laughs> but, but no, it tends to you know, people brew up the most, the most obscure kind of terms and then they enter into the mainstream and then we're forced to decipher and, and build worlds around absolute nonsense. So, yeah, they're the primary offenders of this. That's part of the reason of, you know, challenging the kind of, you know, the structuring and the spaces, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to imagine new kinds of spaces. Yeah, uh, a new kind of academe. It's the time anyway. Thank you. I, I just have to uh, read the last comment and I, I fully agree. I love your straight one-liner answers. That's also from Jenny. Uh, very deep. <laughs> um, Thank you, guys. <laughs> it is, uh, we've sort of paved the ground nicely for the, for the next point to follow, which is the conversation with artists and the question of artistic and academic knowledge production, co-production, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Let's see where it gets from there. And uh, I will hand over uh, not thank you, but thank you very much. I just want to thank you so much again uh, for, for a marvelous lecture that will stay in our heads uh, for a long time to come. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for showing up. Bye. Mm -hmm.